Ten years ago, the U.S. empire honed its sights more intently on a profitable region of the world, the continent it once ravaged as a captain of the slave trade. A new massive military command, AFRICOM, was born. AFRICOM covers 53 African countries, including surrounding islands and all oceans. It consists of four main components, all with interesting names. U.S. Army Africa, U.S. Naval Forces Africa, U.S. Air Forces Africa, and U.S. Marine Corps Africa. Although most U.S. military presence on the continent has been under the auspices of humanitarianism, AFRICOM officer Rick Cook admitted that the U.S. has been at war in Africa for years. Its footprint includes an array of drone bases, camps and compounds carrying out the American tradition of training and arming proxy militaries responsible for flagrant human rights abuses, and a variety of black ops. Far from a low-intensity war on the continent, AFRICOM averages several missions every single day. Every empire has longed for ownership of Africa for the same reason, its unimaginable treasure of minerals and raw materials. Much of that buried wealth is concentrated in Africa's south, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The DRC is home to 80 million people with 250 different ethnic groups and over 700 distinct languages and dialects. Taking into account its untapped minerals, it's considered the richest country in the world, with reserves worth $24 trillion. The DRC has 10% of the world's copper, 30% of its diamonds, and 70% of the world's coltan and it produces over 50% of the world's cobalt. Among Congolese who literally risk their lives working in cobalt mines, tens of thousands are children, working 12 hours a day for a dollar. Paying local militias to illegally dig, Western mining giants make millions off this criminal enterprise, including Adostra Minerals and Bechtel Incorporated. I spoke to Kambali Musavuli, spokesperson for Friends of the Congo, about the country's resource curse and how empires have shaped the region. During Mobutu's rule in 1982, the Congressional Budget Office released a report entitled Cobalt Policy Options for a Strategic Mineral, outlining how the shortfall of cobalt is obviously a concern for U.S. national security. Talk about what cobalt is and the significance of this report. Congo is the number one producer of cobalt in the world. Even when we have peace and no peace, we are still the number one producer of cobalt in the world. There is a high chance that your batteries of your cars, of the batteries of your phones, your TVs, all those electronics that you use today has cobalt from the Congo, but no one knows that. But the, the document you point out is very particular. Like when people look at the cobalt policy, I see it in twofold. The first vulnerability, the reason why they created the cobalt policy is because there was shortage of cobalt in Congo. This was caused by a rebellion. There was a rebellion in the late 70s that disrupted the exploitation of cobalt in the Congo. And that made people worried in the United States. Americans noticed this because in the 1980 and 1981, there was shortage of color TV in the US. Consumers did not know why we had shortage of color TVs but it was directly connected to the cobalt in Congo. So we had to figure out, okay, we don't produce cobalt in the United States. We don't have a known reserve of cobalt in the United States. The country where we get cobalt, back then it was called Zaire, it's now Congo, has a president that we have installed. What needs to be our policy toward it? So this document was the justification of supporting Mobutu knowing that he was pilfering Congo's uh, national coffers, uh, he was uh, actually you know, killing dissid uh, dissidents in the country, and so on. But because he was so essential for our access to cobalt, we supported him. Not just because of our electronic device. The first vulnerability is not electronics. If there is a shortage of cobalt in the United States, it will impact the US military. And they said in the document, right up and sight that without Congo's cobalt, we'll have problems waging war. We will have problems with that. What does the US military use cobalt for? You cannot have a drone without cobalt. You cannot have uh, your planes without cobalt. You cannot send a space shuttle without cobalt. In your nuclear uh, reactor, you see that also. I mean, it's used virtually in mo most of the uh, major uh, military and aerospace equipments. 
if there is a shortage of cobalt, we can wage a war. That's the first vulnerability of the cobalt policy. So if we want peace in the world, let's make sure that Congo is in control of the Congolese so that they can use the resources to better their lives, have clean water and electricity and better life in their own country, rather than seeing the minerals flee, uh, fleecing the country, going to Western nation, and it's being used in, military, um, in the military industry causing havoc around the world. From first gold to rubber to human slaves to now cobalt, Africa has endured over five centuries of oppression and theft by European empires. So much so that the entire capitalist world was able to develop through an annihilating policy of underdeveloping Africa. The Congo has a common colonial origin story. The diverse landscape, which contained 450 independent African groups, had borders drawn around it in the 1880s as a private holding of European investors. The colonial project was formally recognized as the Congo Free State at the 1884 Berlin Conference, a meeting to divide Africa by European empires and no Africans. The Congo Free State's head fat cat was the bloodthirsty Belgian King Leopold II, who led an army that conquered the region, murdered its African leader, and brutally repressed its people. The mad king broadcast to the world his noble mission of bringing civilization to the newly formed Congo. Meanwhile, he was pillaging and plundering every inch. His tactics included cutting off the hands of workers, including child laborers, for the crime of failing to meet their daily rubber production quota. Leopold and his military commanders even encouraged their soldiers to collect severed hands as a measure of success. But on February 26, 1885, Henry Sanford was signing on behalf of the United States that document saying that the giving this huge land called the Congo to Leopold II. Leopold II controlled the land as an individual. He was this corporate mo mogul. I can't compare him to Donald Trump, who he says, I want real estate. I have a very tiny country called Belgium, but I need a land that has so much resources. So they gave him the land. He was the CEO of the Congo, the so-called independent state of the Congo. But with that land, they were exploding rubber, they were exploding um, elephant tusks, specific ivory, abroad. During this time, according to the Adam Huxley's book, we had about 10 million Congolese dying. It was modern day slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I should even say modern day slavery because slavery is slavery, mm -hmm. right? They will take Congolese and take them to the field. You, you, ha you have to bring rubber. So let's say if I don't bring 60 kilogram of rubber, that's my quota. No, I need to bring that amount every day. Either I will be beaten to death or killed, or my hand will be chopped off. And because of the brutality, the population of the Congo at the time was about 20 million, according to the census, and it decreased to 10 million. But the world didn't know. Now, all we knew is that Ford is making this nice car with nice uh, tires. We never questioned American business people where they were getting their rubber from. We just were saying that this is the industrial, uh, industrialized world and we have all these materials, but we never asked where it's, it's coming from. Mm -hmm. But it directly affected the population that was cut into half in a period of 10 years. During that time, because of people speaking up, Congo was taken away from Leopold, but it was not given back to the Congolese. It was given to Belgium. So from 1908 to about 1960, Congo was under Belgian rule. So when you look at the archives videos of the Belgian rule, you will see videos where you have this white Belgian speaking in front of a class, uh, teaching the Congolese how to be civilized. And they will have all these propaganda videos being shown in Belgium, where they will literally say they were bringing civilization, uh, civilization to Congolese teaching them how to eat, how to open doors, how to use a fork. That's how people live. Mm -hmm. So when a Belgian sees that on national TV, it's, oh, we're doing great work in Africa. We're teaching people how to be civilized. No question about how the uranium that was used to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki came from the Congo. The Belgians took it out of the Congo and gave it to the Manhattan Project in New York City. No, that's, that was uranium from the Congo. There is no question that in the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe, Congo's copper was essential. 
They were not treating them as citizens or even as human beings. That's what caused it, uh, not just in the Congo, but across the continent uh, through the colonization period, people to rise up. Because we say, wait a minute, I'm a human being. Why am I not being treated as a human being? Mm -hmm. So many Africans, specifically in the Congo, many young Congolese rose up. That's how Patrice Lumumba rose to prominence. Prime Minister Lumumba was part of a breakthrough period for the never-ending resistance to colonialism. In the 1940s through the 80s, colonized peoples all over Africa formed political parties, waged battles for self-determination, and expelled their European overlords. From Angola to Guinea-Bissau to South Africa, independence movements inspired oppressed peoples everywhere. The DRC was no exception. Che Guevara even risked his life on the battlefields to aid Congolese liberation. After almost a century of that colonial rule um, from Belgium, in 1960, Congo chose its first democratically elected leader, Patrice Lumumba. Talk about the struggle that made this happen and the significance of Lumumba's victory. Patrice Lumumba is a um, glitch in the empire. That's the way I look at him. Uh, he was also among the elite, if you, you may say, the elite Congolese, uh, meaning that in Congo, you couldn't study after eighth grade under colonial rule. So literally, after eighth grade, you, you're not getting any education. And then you take a test uh, where they give you a card saying that you're a civilized person. So they actually had cards that say, you no know, civilized card. That, that they would say you are civilized, as they say that. With that card, it allowed you to go downtown, to, uh, to be able to drive, uh, to go to movie theaters. Because you couldn't end up downtown in all these Western stores without a car, you'd be arrested. So Lumumba was amongst those who had that access. But he understood something very fundamental, which was not part of the elite class. He understood that we didn't control our land. So he took the voice of the villagers who were saying what we say, Likamboyamabele, the problem of land, sovereignty, and took it to prominence. He understood the importance of Africa being united. He understood the place of Congo in the unity of Africa. So he speaks and he was asking for immediate independence. That there is no reason why a Belgian person should be in the Congo beating Congolese on their own soil and treating them as inhumane. I said, we are adults, we can control our own country. In 1958, a 34-year-old Lumumba spoke at an international Pan-African conference hosted by the Prime Minister of newly independent Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah. There, he talked about the national aspiration of emancipating Congolese from the boot of colonialism. During the Pan-African Congress, Kwame Nkrumah uh, created the plan of a United States of Africa. Guess where was the capital? The capital was Kinshasa. Back then, it was called Leopoldville. And they understood that if Congo is free, Africa will be free because they saw the Congo with its resources as the heart that will spread its energy across the continent. The Congo River that can provide electricity to the whole African continent. We know that, but it has not been exploited. The arable land, Congo has the potential to feed the whole entire world until 2050 when the world's population is 9 billion people and Africans are not even getting access to food. And it's all these uh, resources Congo had, Lumumba had the mission to go make sure that the Congolese can be independent and use it as a benefit of uh, the Congolese and of course the African continent as a whole. But it was a threat to Western powers. Lumumba made it clear to Western powers that if he was elected, he was in control of the Congo, he will make sure that the resources of the Congo are benefit the Congolese people. I wanted you to also explain um, how in 1965, of course, Lumumba was deposed by a Western-backed coup, um, replaced by anti-communist military dictator Mobutu Seko. What forces made this happen? The United States. Um, effectively, after Patrice Lumumba won the elections of uh, May 1960, uh, within a few weeks of him being in power, he was deposed. Uh, within months, he was assassinated by the CIA on January 17th, 1961. Um, I'm imagining even the stories that we have on record is that he was killed, buried. Then they had to dig his body out because they were afraid that wherever they buried him, people would use that area as a place of pilgrimage. And then they chopped his body off to pieces and put it in acid 
and made sure that there was no remaining of Patrice Lumumba. He was a democratically elected leader of a country assassinated simply because he wanted the resources of his country to benefit his people. But after the killing of Lumumba, we saw this accession to power of, uh, Lumumba, uh, of Mobutu, Mobutu Seseko, who was supported by the CIA. Like, what's beautiful sometimes, it's kind of a contradiction in the United States, right? You do these things in the dark, after 50 years, you can disclose the official document. And when we read the records of the 60s, that's been 40% made available now, we see how much money we put forward to support a dictator that we installed in the Congo for 32 years. From 1965 to 1997, Mobutu, was supported by the West until the United States decided that they do not like him anymore. He's, he doesn't serve uh, the interests of the West, just as they did with Saddam Hussein. Um, they, they decided to support a coup, uh, a military uprising, not led by Congolese, but led by US allies running in Uganda. The United States supported the invasions of the Congo in 1997 to topple the regime of Mobutu which now, because of the military action, he has taken the lives of over six million Congolese. What was the main force driving this ongoing genocide and what role does Rwanda have to play in it? And we have to contextualize it too. Mm -hmm. Who was the president of the United States in that time? Bill Clinton was the president of the United States during those invasions. So when you see Bill Clinton as the president of the United States with a National Security Council office, making decisions on the way forward for Africa, those were the decisions that he had to make. He had to make a decision on the Rwanda genocide in 1994. He had to make a decision on Somalia, the so-called Black Hawk Down. And he had to make a decision on the Congo. All three decisions were a disaster, all of them. And I uh, still remember when Black Hawk Down happened, uh, I was young back then, uh, speaking to people that didn't understand why Somalis were shooting at American soldiers. I said, you are an invader. That's why they're shooting at you. If you are not there, you'll not be shot. So that's the reality. But now to go to the Congo, Bill Clinton uh, and his staff at the time, Susan Rice um, and others, they created this and table principles, which coming out of those principles, they were speaking about the so-called Renaissance leaders of Africa. Uh, they chose African leaders saying, this is the new wave. Coming out of the Cold War, the Wall of Berlin has fall. Africa needs the new kind of leaders. Mobutu was our Cold War um, agent. Mm -hmm. now, Mobutu, the president of Congo back then, Zaire, allowed the United States to have unfettered access to Congo's resources. But when the wall fall, you don't need Mobutu anymore. So let's reshape the region. In 1997, in order to remove Mobutu, the United States decided to support their allies, Yuri Museveni in Uganda and Paul Kagame in Rwanda, in the invasions of the Congo. They were successful at toppling Mobutu, but they installed a leader named Kabila, Laurent Kabila. Western business interests and politicians put in power the father of current President Joseph Kabila, rebel leader Laurent Kabila. The chairman of American Mineral Fields was even gracious enough to openly financially back his rebel forces fighting Mobutu. In exchange for their investment, the senior Kabila promised them a $1 billion mining contract. Laurent Kabila was brought to power during the deadliest war in modern African history with mass killings and widespread atrocities involving nine African countries. The Congolese people suffered primarily from invasions by the armies of Rwanda and Uganda, two brutal pro-Kabila dictatorships that continue to be financially backed by the U.S. The second invasion of the Congo was so terrible that even my family, we had to flee. Uh, we left in, um, in August of 1998. But what continue after, which is really a score to the human conscience, that millions of life died, but how did they die? So you have foreign troops on the ground, terrorizing population, killing them, burying them alive. In 2001, Laurent Kabila's son Joseph seized power after his father was assassinated. He's now grasping to hold on to power during a bloody civil war. 
So Joseph Kabila has been uh, president of the Congo since 2006, a presidential election set for November of this year, 2016. But everything he's done, it looks like he's actually going to extend his terms and violate the constitution. What will happen to the DRC if he does do that? The hope is a revolution, uh, but uh, we have to also take a historical look of how long he's been around. You know, in 2001, his so-called father was assassinated. Uh, Congo is not a monarchy, but he ascended to power. So there is always a question of how did he become the president of Congo in 2001? So as he was installed, a uh, Western nation recognized him as the president of the Congo. He stayed there till the official election in 2006. So he's been there for almost uh, over 15 years uh, in power. But uh, in 2006, there was hope that Congolese will decide there were two top con uh, contenders, Joseph Kabila and Jean-Pierre Mbemba, who is currently at the International Criminal Court, uh, facing charges of crimes a quote-unquote committed in Central African Republic. But at the end of uh, the elections, Kabila was declared the winner. There was an uprising in Congo. This is actually the first time in history where Western diplomats were bombed in a bunker in Congo. So he almost killed a dozen diplomat because he was afraid that the West shifted. But of course, there was no accountability after that. All Western nations banked on Kabila. The reason why they banked on him, they saw him as a leader they could control to get access to Congo's minerals. During his power, you can see that many mining contracts have been signed that didn't benefit the Congolese people. And the International Crisis Group actually noted that, that in 2007, Western nations banked on Kabila because they felt this was our guy you know, that we can control. Mm -hmm. So in 2011, which was the second official election uh, according to our constitution, there were, that election was also rigged. In some areas, Kabila won by over 100%. Numerous election monitoring bodies, including the Carter Center, called the results illegitimate. The U.S. wavered for three months amidst mass protests before officially recognizing Kabila as president of the DRC constitutionally allowed only two terms. His recent move to delay the upcoming election with a nationwide census was met with fierce opposition. When it was voted into the parliament and now moving into the Senate, uh, the youth of the Congo took it to the streets. They were watching what the, politi what the politicians, uh, politicians were doing and they took it to the streets and they shut down a city of 15 million people young Congolese from, I'll say, 15 to 20-some years old who were watching the political scene. So for two straight weeks, they were protesting, facing the police, saying no to the change of the constitution. Scores were killed. The official numbers are that there were 42 people who were killed. But when we look at the fact on the ground, uh, in March of the same year, uh, last year, we found our uh, even the locals, the United Nations, found the mass grave in Kinshasa with 425 bodies. For decades, the empire has employed and backed such brutal tactics. But with changing times comes changing strategies, including a deceptive presentation of its role there. From Cuba to the Congo, the U.S. and its minions have invested into youth resistance movements in order to co-opt their country's futures. What is the role of USAID and the Young African Leadership Initiative? Uh, Young African Leadership Initiative was created in 2010. It was almost as a response to, uh, from Obama to African leaders. 2010, many African countries celebrated their 50 years of independence. He wanted to show an image that I'm not supporting these strong men. I'm going to support the youth. So it was this image of bringing young African youth leaders here to say that you are the future leaders of your country. But the problem with it is it has created an elitist group, unfortunately. Uh, you, you are bringing young African leaders uh, here, connecting them with institutions in the United States, teaching them American politics. So I met one of the youth in 2010, and uh, the individual was sharing with me how they spent their whole day studying federalism. And I was asking <laughs> myself, no, why are they teaching you federalism? So yeah, they took us to Capitol Hill, uh, they took us to some institution in Washington to show us how the federal system works in the United States. And I said, that's very problematic. 
that you're bringing young people there. And then the presentation of what is actually happening is that this system works for us. Right. So then these young people will go back on the ground and say, I met a, a, legislator sta a legislative staff, I met people on the Hill, this is how it operates, and yet they don't see the inner uh, issues within the political system in the United States. So to me, I'm saying, okay, I'm understanding in concept why it's great to empower youth. Mm -hmm. But when the United States government is having a network of 100,000 young African youth leaders, that's problematic. Because if China has a network of 100,000 young Americans, Americans will speak up. I said, I have concern that this country is doing such and such. Because we're not talking about an NGO, we're talking about the United States government. Half of the Congolese population is under the age of 18, and the majority of them are Congolese women. So we know for any change in the Congo to happen, it's going to happen through the, uh, through the youth and through the women. So when you see that potential happening, and you are the United States government, you know that your interests are at stake, that you, there will be new leaders in the Congo who are not connected with you, who, are, who may make decisions beyond your interest. So you want to make sure that right now you are already embedded with those youth leaders. And this is a repeat of history because the United States played the same card in the 1960s. What is the solution to all this? How can we build solidarity from within the empire to help Congolese uh, take control of their own resources? American people can help by having a true and real democracy. Because the empire has so many tentacles. We can be successful in the Congo in having a revolution and changing the country. But that doesn't mean that that's going to be the case for Chad, that's going to be the case for Afghanistan, and other places around the world who want to have better, uh, a better life, a better opportunity. It all starts here.